Um, uh, thank you to everyone and uh, for your patience and for being still here after a very, very long day of uh, uh, deep learning and uh, related approaches. So uh, what I'm going to, to, to present is, uh, is a case study. I mean, we have been working on a specific problem and um, after several uh, several approaches uh, we also ap uh, applied the deep learning approach and that's what i'm going to present today so um just let me uh well thanks uh, my my team or the people involved in the in this project who are xavier brochet and mainly chabna matai which is uh, also uh, following the course today uh, but um, she has already applied deep learning in, in this context so um, that's uh, that being said, I just uh, oh, let me see what else. Okay. Um, the outline of my presentation is uh, well, it's mainly four points. Uh, short introduction to show you the research question, the methodology, and then some results and conclusions and perspective is quite. Uh, schematic and uh, you will see that I'm not going to present uh, several words, many words as, as some people have, have done, but specific, uh, a specific uh, project where we applied uh, quite systematic uh, method and just to, to share that and uh, hoping that uh, that will uh, tell you how do we work on, uh, in, in some cases. Okay, the research question is related to phage therapy. Uh, the phage therapy uh, relates or corresponds to an alternative uh, way of uh, dealing with the bacteria, with pathogenous bacteria or bacteria in general, and is using their natural enemies. I mean, uh, phage therapy was uh, more or less the standard before antibiotic therapies in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. And because of the uh, antibiotics uh, coming in first line, uh, the phages were more or less uh, forgot, forgotten. And uh, the concept is, is uh, easy. Uh, there are viruses that uh, feed on bacteria that uh, infect bacteria to, to reproduce. And um, they are the natural enemies. They have co-evolved with bacteria for uh, millions of years. And if you can identify the phage that is able to infect a specific bacteria, then you can uh, use them to um, reduce the, the population of the, of the bacteria of that bacterium in particular. So uh, that's uh, a good thing is that the, these uh, phages are highly specific to those, to those bacteria. Then they usually don't have a lot of uh, uh, difficulties or pose uh, the problems uh, for, the, for the people receiving the therapy. So that's uh, a good thing. But finding the right, uh, the right phage could be uh, relatively hard because uh, as bacteria evolve, phages are also evolving. So it's not uh, very easy to say this is the phage for that bacteria because the, the, for this uh, bacteria, because the bacteria, because they are changing. So we need to, to have um, some kind of selection, phage selection process, which can be sometimes relatively hard, relatively uh, demanding in uh, laboratory resources and all these parts. So, this is the, the context uh, where we are interested. And um, the idea is that there are some, some uh, computational approaches uh, which are not necessarily based on, on machine learning. And uh, sometimes you have uh, solutions that uh, go through uh, phage banks, databases, knowledge bases that allows you to do some kind of selection. But uh, in the, evidently in the last years, there is a lot of predictive approaches uh, which tries to say, okay, this could be the most uh, um, active uh, fetch against uh, a given bacterium, bacterium. 
and uh, most of the approaches are based on similarity and uh, more and more approaches are based on models and predictive models. So I'm not going to, to present uh, the, the state of the art of uh, several or many approaches, but I'm going to mention a little bit about our own predictive approaches, which are intended to work only on genomes. And that's something that it's a decision we took at the beginning of the project with our partners, but it's not necessary, necessarily the only possibility, but in our case, is that the condition we decided to, to accept. And uh, we developed first, uh, more or less uh, conventional, in quotes, uh, machine learning approach based on feature engineering, feature extraction from these genomes, and then processing with the uh, classifiers. Uh, and uh, once we obtained results with that approach and we saw some of the limitations and the difficulties, we also decided to go through the deep learning approach, not only because it's becoming uh, quite uh, normal to, to use uh, deep learning in many, many contexts, but because also because uh, you, in principle, deep learning allows us to avoid this uh, feature engineering part because uh, we are not, we are never sure that we are looking for the right features. And let's see if the deep learning can uh, provide that part of the, of, of the advantages of, uh, of using that. Okay, so that, that uh, take us to our research question is, how could we predict those interactions between phages and bacteria based only on their genomic sequences and using deep learning because that's the, the one thing I, we want to. So for that, uh, we need data and that's uh, the methodology is a relatively simple pipeline, simple conceptually. We need to collect data, to prepare that data based on some exploratory data analysis. We can then uh, make decisions and then apply the, the models. And finally, well, we, are, we analyze the results. For the data collection, we used uh, two sources. Uh, first source is uh, what we call the public data set extracted from a public databases, such as FHDB and GeneBank. I think there is any missing there. And uh, you can see that we were trying to predict at the strain level. So we, from that one, we obtained almost 100 uh, bacterial uh, strains and uh, almost a double from the private data set. The private data set is another data set that we obtained with uh, our partners. Uh, in this pro in the, the previous project, uh, our partners uh, we were partnering with the University of Lausanne and the and the uh, Insel Spital in Bern. So um, from uh, them we obtain a much more structured uh, data set uh, with uh, more strains, more bacterial strains, but uh, as you can see, a much uh, more uh, reduced a set of phages and um, with a more or less equivalent number of, uh, of interactions. So I will perhaps mention that a little bit later. After that, as I uh, we, need, we need to prepare uh, this data, but to make uh, uh, here, uh, well, some uh, operations that are removing phages with the genomes uh, or phages and bacteria with genomes which were not of the right size because these were just in the data set. Uh, duplicated values where sometimes you have a different uh, different identifier for the, the same genome, etc. So cleaning this data set, we reduced then the amount of uh, interactions at around 10% because and I, I concentrate on interactions because that's the one the, the one thing we want to, to predict is that bacterium is being infected or potentially infected by that phage. So it's the interaction is the, the center of our interest. And um, you can see uh, that we have uh, 7,000, almost 6,000 uh, interactions at our uh, 
disposition for, for this project. So we can also look a little bit uh, rapidly to the data. Well, we did more than that, but one thing that this first comes to the, to the mind is that the public data set, we created the more or less balanced uh, uh, data set, knowing that in the public data set, and I'm going to mention that later, there is no negative or almost no negative um, interactions reported, while in the private data sets, these negative interactions were validated experimentally in the, in the laboratory. So um, that's one first thing. The second thing is the genomes. And we can see that the lengths of the genomes are relatively variable, uh, much more variable in the, um, in the private data set, while in the public data set, we have a lot of uh, uh, genomes which are close to 7 million uh, bases. In the phages side, you can see that the distributions are relatively similar. Um, but well, the number of uh, phages is also very, very different. So that give us a, a first um, approach to the size of the genomes we are going to deal with. So we are having here uh, genomes of, uh, in one case, several millions of, uh, of bases, and in the other case, uh, some tens of thousands of, of bases. Okay, so, to continue, uh, for deep learning in the kind of uh, first model we tried, we need to have fixed sequences lengths. So we, we were obliged to have some, uh, to make some decisions. Then we decided to limit the sizes of the phages to 200,000 uh, bases and for, uh, for bacteria to 7 million bases. And just note that um, we have two kinds of organisms with a very different lengths. So uh, that's also uh, somehow a challenge that I'm going to mention also in, in one or two slides. And just to come to finish here, uh, if we have, uh, we have shorter sequences, we padded that with a, a no, uh, with, with zeros. And for the longer sequences, we were obliged to truncate them, knowing that uh, the sizes we, we selected were intended to uh, less, uh, lost as few as possible uh, information. So finally, uh, we coded that, and that's uh, the database where we use, the data set we use uh, for training the, the approach. And as usual, we used uh, separation in train and validation sets and test set. And in this case, we use 65%, 35%. I'm not going to stop uh, a lot of here, a lot of time here, but then we need uh, to come with an architecture. As I mentioned, one of the challenges is the fact that we have two organisms and we have uh, whole genomes from uh, these organisms and we have uh, different genome lengths and very different genome lengths, which is somehow a challenge because if we just put together the bacterium and the phage in a given uh, interaction, then uh, the information coming from the bacterium will be much bigger than what that of the bacterial phage. And in some cases, the factor is not 35, but uh, even much, uh, much bigger. So, because of that, we, we came with an approach where uh, we use uh, two different uh, neural networks for, for separately pre-processing, if you want, the, the both uh, the organism uh, genomes. And at the end, we, we combine that uh, for doing the, the, the final interaction prediction. If we look at that more in a, in a more schematic way, uh, we have here uh, the architecture. You can see that uh, first we use two different um, set of uh, layers of convolutional layers for uh, the bacterial genome and for the phage genome separately. 
we call that multi-context modeling because each each organism is uh, learned uh, separately, but given that we are predicting interactions and not independent activities on the or independent uh, characteristic of the, of both organisms, then we are finally uh, mixing both of them in a in a full uh, connected layer, and that can re uh, remind a little bit what we. Uh, just saw in the last presentation with the um, partial uh, latent spaces for uh, combining different kinds of information. In that case, is uh, something similar. And uh, just notice that um, the bacterial the bacterial convolutional part is uh, deeper than that of the phage. In that way, when we arrive to the the final prediction layer, or layers, because there are two of them, uh, the amount of information is relatively the same. So there is no uh, phenomenon of uh, completely losing the phage genome information. That's the, that was one of the, um, the most important decisions at a given moment because we were having problems trying to put all together or even up learning with the same architecture in both sides. And um, that amount of information is quite important for, uh, for the final uh, decision. Okay, so we apply that. And after applying that, uh, we obtain uh, some results. I'm not going to, to, to take uh, too long on that. And uh, you can, on the test set, the 35%, as I mentioned, we obtained, uh, for the full set of uh, of bacterial strains and phages that we had in our in our data set, we obtained uh, performances of uh, as you can see uh, from uh, seventy four percent precision, seventy two percent precision to more or less eighty six eighty five accuracy in general, and uh, or around eighty percent for uh, F one score. So. These are the results, and um, we, after that, we also were interested more how is going in the different species, and that some that at uh, that moment we saw that it's not the same for each. The model is only one. We were quite ambitious to say, okay, we are going to have a very universal model for every bacterium, every phage, and then, well, at least those that, that we can have in our databases. And then you can see that uh, while, for example, for Staphylococcus aureus, uh, for staph, you have uh, very, very good performances, knowing that we only have 68 uh, data points there. And you can go down in the recall up to, up to 27% in the the cases, uh, the case of uh, Acinetobacter, and uh, well, it's quite changing. And these are only four species uh, that we selected here. So this universal model uh, is perhaps less universal than we wanted, but that allows us also to see that um, it is, in general, relatively good, but. Uh, there are some things to, to, to address. And that's the results uh, we have. We, have we, we can go even deeper in the analysis of the results, but let me stay here and then go to some analysis of uh, these results and mainly to uh, some conclusions and perspective. In that way, I try to be not too, too late in, at the end. So we consider that our models are relatively good. It's, uh, the, the performance is okay. We wanted more and we still want more, higher performance, higher class, uh, classification performance. And, but that, well, it's an opportunity for improving uh, all these, um, these uh, results. Mm, the other thing that um, is that we, because of the, con of the context of the project, the clinical context, 
we are really interested in predicting at the strain level. So um, what we had at the beginning as only a condition uh, became clearly uh, something that is a hard uh, condition. And we, when we go to compare our approaches to other approach, with other approaches, we, can, we could see that most of the reported works which presents a 95%, 97%. When, we, when you look more carefully, they work mainly at the genus level or even sometimes at higher taxonomy levels. So the host prediction problem here is mainly very rough compared to what we were looking for. And only some of them go to the species level. And we were really looking for at the strain for the strain level. So in that way, we can relat uh, relativize a little bit about the performances we are obtaining. So we need to explore a little bit more how this approach will compare if we use uh, the similar data sets of the, as the others, uh, the other works. So something still to do. And well, uh, it's normal that it's difficult to compare with other works. And um, that's something um, still to do. We are aware of uh, our limitations and uh, clearly the data uh, distribution is uh, not the best one, but this is the one we obtained with going uh, to, to these, um, to these uh, sources. And while we try to keep a balanced distribution with the public data, uh, artificially balanced, uh, the reality from the private data set, I mean, the experimental one, the controlled one, is that it is very unbalanced. There is much more uh, negative uh, interactions because we say that uh, uh, phages are quite uh, specific. So they are not uh, infecting whatever uh, strain or whatever species of, uh, of bacterium, of bacteria. So it's normal that it's, it's quite unbalanced. And uh, having a, an artificially balanced um, data set perhaps is not uh, is something that could be uh, modified. The other thing is that mainly from the public, we have a lot of um, cases from some, or a lot of information about some few um, species which are of uh, wide interest and several others were underrepresented. So the universality we were looking for taking all the, the most possible, the most, uh, uh, be, the, the biggest amount of, um, uh, of a bacteria went under the price of having some of them that are not uh, very well uh, represented. So the, that could explain the uneven predictive power, and uh, we need to deal with that for um, stabilizing the models. But the concept still remains uh, uh, relatively satisfactory. And the other thing that I already mentioned is that the negative interactions are are missing in general in the, from the public, unless we we start doing a lot of experimental work only to obtain. Uh, these negative interactions, then the absence uh, is uh, of this interaction is really reported. The negative results are not uh, part of the of the publication, so um, we were obliged to estimate to use some some guesstimation about the negative uh, interactions, knowing that phages are uh, highly specific. We could more or less uh, do that, uh, but it's not 100% uh, uh, certain that it's the case. And uh, so the negative cases in the public database is perhaps not, are not perhaps a very uh, precise, are very uh, representative of the reality. So knowing that we are exploring what to do next. First, as usual, we try to we will try to improve and expand the reach of the current approach. As I mentioned, the data quality should be uh, improved. But uh, we will 
we, we want also to explore the behavior of our approach in uh, different taxonomy levels uh, from uh, genus uh, to strain to species to strains. And even in some contexts, we are dealing with the variants that evolve uh, during a, a relatively short time, short in quotes. So it's even the same strain in principle, but some variants, and then that's uh, the granularity is uh, much uh, finer. But we also have several ideas and uh, we want to explore to go to build on top of this approach and uh, to explore novel approaches. And that's related with the state of the art also on uh, phage therapy, where they, they need this well known that phages alone uh, are not necessarily very uh, effective against um, against the, some bacteria, but usually you need to use cocktails to avoid uh, uh, resistant development on these bacteria to avoid um, uh, a relatively mild effect on the bacteria. So that's something that it's already known, but there are also investigations on the synergy between uh, phages and anti antibiotics and um, phage plus uh, and CRISPR, and uh, there is also um, an interest on in engineering phages to improve their uh, capacity. I'm going to, to, to speak a little bit about, a little bit more about that. And one, also one uh, line we would like to explore is the use of explainable artificial intelligence methods so as to extract from the models we already built we are going to build, extract, or propose some mechanistic insights, which are the parts of the genomes in the phages that are responsible for highest um, efficacy, ef efficacy or for best, better uh, effect, or for uh, uh, also for uh, failing in infecting a, a bacterium. So this is something that we, we would like to explore. Uh, given that we work also in explainable artificial intelligence. And finally, the second part of the title of the presentation was towards phase genomic editing. And that's one idea that is uh, relatively exploratory. And I would like to just present um, uh, the, the, that idea. The idea is to engineer these bacteriophages so as to increase their uh, antibacterial action, uh, host range or the infection efficacy, etc. The common methods are recombination based, and uh, there are also um, some methods uh, which are called on genome rebooting. All these are very experimental stuff. I'm not a biologist, so I try to understand how the how that works from a biological and experimental point of view, but. The, the idea that is more appealing for me is, the, is to engineer the, geno the genomes. Given that we are already working with genomes, uh, how could we modify those genomes so as to improve the activity? And I, I put here in, in red, our idea is to uh, look for potential genomic interventions uh, within silico methods. And from that point of view, we have a new question, is how could we modify the genomic sequence of those bacteriophages using deep learning models uh, with the goal of improving their therapeutic value? From a Simon engineer, uh, I have the vision of, okay, we can do some modifications and we would like to improve something, optimization. So that calls for some kind of uh, feedback loop where we have genomes, we have the model I, I just presented, and the model is predicting the interaction of, uh, of, of these genomes. And should I, should I be able to take information from these predictions so as to maybe being able to modify somewhere 
the genome of the bacteriophage so as to improve its action. I know that uh, it's hard to say we are going to modify whatever because we, we can have uh, genomes that are not viable as organisms. So we know, I'm aware that there are some constraints, uh, biological constraints, but because of that, we are trying to, to do uh, very uh, targeted uh, modifications. But the idea is, uh, is that one, we have a specific bacteria, uh, perhaps a reduced amount of bacteria of interest. We have bacteriophages from our, our phage bank or whatever uh, kind of, uh, of SARS. And then we use the predictor, the predictor we already developed and its predictions to drive a generator. This generator can take several forms. We have explored, um, we have explored autoencoders, uh, uh, generative, generative networks. Uh, we have been exploring LSTMs and different architectures. And I will, I will be very happy to present that work in a future version of this course or in another event. And uh, with that, with this idea, I. Um, finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks to my team because uh, they are doing the hard work of uh, uh, dealing with all this data and uh, well, thank you very much.